Well, hey, we have been in a series for the last couple of weeks entitled By Faith. Someone say By Faith. And uh, By Faith is more than just a series that we're focusing in on for a few weeks. It is the theme of the Father's House in 2022. It is our mantra. It is our DNA. At the beginning of this year, if you've been joining us for the last couple of weeks, you know that we felt the Holy Spirit compel us to elevate our faith in 2022, to believe for the impossible, to begin to pray some bigger prayers, some riskier prayers, to trust God in ways that we've never trusted Him before, to, to be those audaciously bold people that come right into the presence of God and by faith begin to make some requests. And, and it's one thing to, to say that. It's one thing to put it on a screen or on some scrims out there in the lobby or on a hat, some merchandise. It's an entirely different thing to begin to live that out. And for just a moment before we get too deep into the message today, I want to take a moment and just honor somebody in the room that I've seen live this out over the last couple of weeks. And as a result, we've seen God do a miracle in his life. Uh, my friend Bryson, are you still in here, Bryson? Right over there. So, so Bryson right here, he was just up on the stage. Uh, he's the guy with um, an extra personality and a need of a haircut back there. My God, perm that thing. Business in the front, party in the back. Hallelujah, okay. But uh, Bryson, Bryson came running up to me last weekend at this service in the middle of worship. And I'm just standing there minding my own business, hanging out with Jesus, eyes closed. And all of a sudden I feel some breath on my face. And I'm like, that's not appropriate COVID protocol, is it now? So I open up my eyes and Bryson is standing right here face to face with me. And he's like, Tim, I need you to pray with me right now. I believe God wants to heal me. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, a couple of weeks ago, just under three weeks ago, uh, Bryson was in a fight and he got kicked in the head. Not like with somebody, like in an altercation. He does that, like he fights for fun, like MMA, Muay Thai, that kind of thing. And he got kicked in the side of the head. And uh, as he was, uh, I guess afterwards he found out and we went to the doctors that there was some neurological damage and some cranial bleeding. And as a result of that, he had some pretty intense vertigo and half of his face was completely paralyzed. And the doctors told him when he went back in to get checked up that uh, he may never regain movement in his face. And if he was fortunate, maybe within about eight weeks, he might see some signs of movement, but it would take at least eight months for him to see any kind of full restoration for his, his face to begin to move like normal again. And, you know, Bryson being the man of faith that he was, he's like, cool, I hear what you're saying, but my God is bigger and I'm going to trust him for healing. So we've been praying for him. And last week he came forward and, and asked for prayer. And uh, I found out Monday that he, uh, he called me and he said, all of the vertigo is completely gone. I have no vertigo any longer. And when he went to the doctor this last week to get a checkup, less than three weeks uh, from the incident, uh, nearly 100% of his movement has been restored to his face. So no more paralysis. The brain is working. His brain is working so well that he might go get a haircut this week. Hallelujah. No, but come on, that's a miracle to see God move. And let me tell you what happened. Someone had the audacity to run up in the middle of a worship service and say, I need prayer, to reach out and say, I believe that God can, can heal me. And God responds. God always responds to faith. And God responded to Bryson's faith and said, hey, if you will believe me, then you will see it come to pass in your life. So I want to give God praise. I want to honor Bryson today as a man who lives by faith. May we all walk into that this year. And to help us do that, to help us live these by faith kind of lives, uh, we've been looking at a key portion of scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, a scripture that both displays and defines what this by faith kind of life is supposed to look like. Some have called it the hall of faith. It is a collection of stories of those that came before us who lived these crazy, audacious, faithful lives. And uh, our key text is in Hebrews 11, one through three, that reads, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. By faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And during our first week, we spent the entirety of our time on that text. We defined what it looks like to live by faith said that faith is a foundation that all of our hopes are built upon. And then in the second week, we began to look at some of these stories, the collection of stories of these faithful people. We looked at Cain and Abel and how uh, Abel brought the first and the best to God. And we determined that if we're going to be by faith people, we need to bring God the first and the best of our lives and not the rest of our lives. And then we talked about a guy named Noah who built a boat in his backyard. And we determined that if we're going to be by faith people, we need to build something with our lives. And then last week, my goodness, if you were not here last week, let me just tell you, last week was probably one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my lifetime. Uh, and I wasn't preaching. 
My wife brought an incredible message last week on Enoch. And I know she didn't do this at the 11 o'clock service. She did it at the nine. She took up a couple of moments in her sermon to honor me. So I'm going to, since I have a microphone in my hand, I want to take a moment and honor her if I could, not just for preaching an amazing message, but for being such an incredible example of what that message truly was. Uh, she, she shared last week, you shared last week, that uh, the title of the message was to keep walking. And the goal was to inspire all of us to walk with God as Enoch walked with God. Uh, but more than a message, I want to thank you that you are one who walks with God and that you have been an example to so many, hundreds of people that watch your life and they get to see what it looks like to walk in true honesty and in lockstep with the Holy Spirit. I, I was reminded of a, a statement last week that a, a guy named Bob Sorge made in a sermon years ago. He said, people don't come to hear what you say. People come to watch you burn. And, and I, I just was sitting there in the first row last week and just listening to that message and going, I love that I, we get the experience of sitting in a room with people who burn for Jesus and their fire begins to ignite fires in all the rest of us. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for walking with Jesus the way you walk with Jesus. It is an honor to be inspired by you. I love you. I'll see you later. Okay. <laughs> Little tip for the husbands. Anytime you get a microphone in a room full of people, honor your wives. It yields dividends. Hallelujah. Where was I? What's happening right now? It's church. Okay, sermon. Today, we're going to enter into the next of the characters here in Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at the great father of our faith, Abraham, for the next couple of weeks. Hebrews has much to say about him, and so we're going to spend a few weeks talking about him. Our key text for today is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. It says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home, go to another land that God would give him as, an, as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land that God promised to him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Keep that on the screen for just a second. This text tells us there were two things that Abraham did that displayed his faith. It says that by faith, he left his home and he went to a place that God would show him. And by faith, when he arrived in the land that God was bringing him into, he lived there. By faith, he left and by faith, he lived. Today, I wanna, I wanna look at both of those words. I wanna discuss, if we're gonna be people like Abraham, people of faith like Abraham was, we need to know what it looks like to leave some things by faith and to live by faith in the place that God is calling us to. And so I want to offer you a title, and, uh, and then we're going to pray and get into this. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. I want to call this chat, You Can't Stay Here. Come on, let's say that together. You can't stay here. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Come on, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now to speak to us over these next couple of moments. You are faithful to do so. Anytime we open up the scriptures, you are faithful to reveal Jesus to us. And we ask that we would see you through the ancient text today, through the conversations that we would not see people around us or man on a stage, but we would see Jesus by the time we leave this place. I, I, I pray specifically for those who find themselves in a season where they are stuck, stuck in their faith, stuck in the past. They don't know how to leave some things behind. By the time we leave today, I ask that they would have said no to the past and yes to all that you have for their future. Help us to walk by faith today in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen. So, so you can't talk about faith without talking about Abraham. Abraham is a big deal in the Bible. He, he's, he's a pretty important figure. Uh, in fact, one of the most when it comes to our faith. If faith was a basketball team, uh, Abraham would be the Michael Jordan, the Kobe Bryant, the Wardell Stephen Curry of the team. Uh, I am leaving LeBron James out of that conversation, and you can draw your own conclusions as to why I might do so. But he's a big deal. And it's not that there's not other really important faith characters in the Bible. Like Abel's good. He's, he's going to give you a couple of, uh, of assists, you know. And Enoch, he's good for a couple of points. Noah, you need him. He's the water boy for the team. But, <laughs> but Abraham's the superstar. He's the main guy when it comes to faith. He, he's the guy that we'll all be lining up for in heaven to get an autograph from. The Bible calls him the father of our faith. 
It, your faith, my faith, it can be traced all the way back to our great, 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 great grandfather, Abraham, which is both alarming and encouraging to me. It's alarming because if you read through the book of Genesis, the 15 chapters of, of Abraham's life, you'll notice that the guy made quite a few mistakes. He, he, he did some things that we would not attribute to a lifestyle of faith. Some face plants, some what, what are you thinking kind of moments. But that is also simultaneously encouraging to me because it means that if God can look at a guy like Abraham and say he is a great man of faith, then he can look at people like you and me who make a whole lot of mistakes but continue to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and follow him again and continue to use us as great men and women of faith regardless of the mistakes that we make. Come on, how many people are grateful today that you serve a God that is not looking at your past but still allows you to be used in the future? Some righteously ratchet folks in the Father's house. Come on. I'm grateful for that. But Abraham is this great man, the father of our faith. And if he gets so much attention in the Bible because of his faith, we would be wise to take a moment and, and consider what made Abraham such an incredible man of faith. Well, the, the scripture here in Hebrews chapter 11, it starts off again by telling us that one of the markers of Abraham's faith was that he left. It says that by faith, Abraham left his home, which I suppose takes a little bit of faith to leave home. In fact, let me check. How, how many of you do not live at home with your parents any longer? If you're single and you're scoping and you still live at home, I give you permission to lie right now and you can raise your hand so that no one judges you. Although ladies, I'm just saying, if he still lives at home with his mom, maybe it's because he's saving money for the ring that he wants to buy you. Hallelujah. Okay. He's probably not. He's probably living in the basement playing video games and he's broke, but you never know. I left my parents' house when I was 21 years old, uh, right as Robin and I were getting married. Yes, we got married very young. And when I, I left my, my house, um, it, it was a little scary for me, mostly because I lived in a home where my mom did everything for us. Uh, my, my dad was working and my mom stayed home to help raise us. And, and my mom did everything for the kids, all three of us. She, she made dinner for us every single night. She packed our lunches for us every single day at school. She kept the, the, the groceries stocked in the cabinets. She changed our sheets every single week on our beds. Literally, until the day I left at 21 years old, my mom did my laundry for me. May the Lord bless you, mother. So it was, it was a little scary leaving home. It took some faith for me to leave my house. I needed to believe that Robin was gonna be able to do all of those things for me <laughs> that my mom had done for me for 21 years. <laughs> I'm kidding. I make some of my lunches now. <laughs> Actually, to this day, truth be told, I still do not know how to do laundry, okay? And I'm nearly 40 years old. And you can judge me all you want. That's fine. I am codependent and I am still thriving in Jesus' name, okay? <laughs> what a misogynist. Okay, whatever. But Abraham left home, yet I don't think it was the leaving of his mother's house or his father's house that was his great claim to faith. I don't think that's why the Bible records him in history as being a great man of faith. In fact, I think it was the way in which Abraham left home that caused us to acknowledge he was a great man of faith. Because the Bible says that when Abraham left home, he did not know where he was going. He left without a predetermined destination. He left into the unknown. He didn't know where he was going. Now, to truly understand that statement, we, we need a little context. So for a couple of moments, I want to go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 11, where we are first introduced to Abraham. He's called Abram in this text. He hasn't yet gotten a name change. And he's living with his father and his siblings in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans. It'll later be known as Babylon. But Here's what it looked like before Abraham left. Genesis eleven twenty seven says, this is the account of Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, when his father Terah was still living. One day, Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, son Abram's wife, his grandson Lot, and he moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and they settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. And then after he dies, we read in Genesis 12, the Lord now said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family. Leave everything that is familiar to you and go to a land that I will show you. 
I will make you into a great nation. I'll bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord instructed. Go to a land that I'm not gonna show you until you leave. <laughs> leave and then I will show you. Where should I go, God? Just, just go. Just, just go and I will show you along the way. The caveat to this command was that Abraham had no idea where he was heading out to until he left. He had to leave first. And somehow in leaving without a destination in mind, we are told that Abraham becomes a great man of faith. Now for some of us, that may not seem like a great move of faith. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to get lost. Maybe you enjoy the idea of getting into a car and just driving around into the countryside and you're like, that sounds like a good time to me. Or maybe you're one of those ladies who, you know, longs for the day that you come home from work and your husband has a bag packed for you and he's like, I had a little surprise trip. You don't know where we're going. Get into the car. We're going to the airport. It's going to be amazing. Maybe you romanticize the idea of going without knowing where you're going. I am not that girl. I do not want that to happen. Come on, where are my itinerary people at? Like, I want to know where I'm headed. I want directions. I want line items. I want to know flight numbers. Like, I am that guy. I like to know where I'm going before I depart. And so if I were Abraham, this would be a very challenging command for me to obey. Go. Where? I don't know, but I'll show you in the process. That seems to be difficult for me. Yet somehow in leaving without a destination, the Lord quantifies that act as faith. Go, and then I will show you. I wonder how many of us are living in a place right now that we know we're not supposed to be, but for fear of not knowing what comes next, we never leave. <laughs> I wonder how many of us are stuck in a situation that God has said, you cannot stay here, but we've planted ourselves because of the unknown. In fact, let me ask it to you like this. Are you living somewhere you should be leaving right now? How are you living? Where are you living? I think people tend to plant themselves in a lot of places for a little bit too long. Maybe you're in a toxic relationship right now with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or dare I say even a fiance, not a spouse. Don't leave them, different sermon, different time. But boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, it's a toxic relationship. You're not equally yoked with that person. They don't know Jesus and you haven't cut covenant with them yet. And you know that God has said, you can't stay here any longer. This relationship is not making you a better follower of Jesus. It is dragging you back in a direction that you came from but in the back of your mind, you're like, where else am I going to go? Who will fulfill this need that I have for love? And I become dependent in, dependent in this relationship. So, so you stay somewhere instead of leaving because of the unknown. Or, or maybe it's not a romantic relationship. Maybe it's a friendship. Listen, I, I am all for winning people to Christ and befriending those that are far from Jesus. But there are some friendships that are just so toxic, you need to leave that thing on the curb and move on. Some friendships that are not healthy for you. And maybe you've been friends with somebody for years, for decades, but many of those decades before you came to Jesus. And now you're a follower of Christ. And so when you get together with that person, suddenly the things that you talk about or the, uh, the things that you obsess over or the, or, or the practices of that friendship are, are no longer things that you know honor God. And yet when you're together with them, you feel this temptation, you feel this draw to go back to the person you used to be instead of the person that you currently are. And for fear of offense or fear of being alone and not having the ride or die that you've had for decades, you stay somewhere that you should be leaving. Maybe it's neither of those. Maybe it is, in fact, a living situation. Maybe you are actually physically living somewhere that you should be leaving. Maybe it's a, a home situation that is not conducive to a, a faithful relationship with Jesus. And whether it's family members or friends or whatever, you know that that environment is toxic. 
But you continue to make excuses for that environment because like, well, people in my culture, this is what we always do, or I don't know where I would go if I left. How would I afford? Who's going to make my lunch? Who's going to make my bed? Who's going to clean my clothes? I'm just going to stay here. But you know, you know that the Holy Spirit has said you can't stay there. And yet we plant ourselves in this environment. I don't know what's outside of this. Maybe it's none of those. Maybe it's not relationships or physical location. Maybe it's an app on the phone or a website on the computer or a cabinet in the kitchen that contains the things that you use to cope with the pain and suffering. And you know that you shouldn't stay there, but you don't know how you will cope, how your urges will be quelled, how your temptations will be met if you get rid of those things. So you live somewhere you should be leaving. Is it getting quiet? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's, it's all here. Maybe the place you're living is a, is a mental space. You keep rehearsing things in your mind. Guilt, shame, trauma, pain, unforgiveness, regret. You just live there in your head and you want desperately to break free of it, but you just can't leave. That, that was the situation in this story. For Abraham's father, Terah, it was a mental space. It was the pain from his past that kept him planted in a place that he was supposed to pass through. Let me prove it to you. Remember the name of that city that he ended up settling in? Look what it says in Genesis 11 again. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran was the father of Lot, but Haran died while, Ur, while in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth, while his father, Terah, was still alive. One day, his dad took his son, Abram, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, and grandson, Lot, moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped where? Haran. They stopped in Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while he was still in Haran. Terah finds himself passing through a city that has the same name as his dead child. And instead of passing through, he decides to plant himself because the pain from his past is dredged up and he can't get over it. He can't get through it. So he ends up living in a space that he was supposed to, set, uh, to pass through. Let me say it like this. He settled in a season. Come on, you've seen some people that have settled in a season, right? There's some believers that have settled in a season. There's a reason it's called a season. It's because it's supposed to inevitably come to an end. It's not supposed to become your narrative or your life story. It's not where you're supposed to plant yourself and live. But so many of us prolong a season because we don't know how to move through it and get to where God's calling us. We just stay in that space. But let me warn you, for those of you who might find themselves stuck in a season, staying there is bigger than you. It will affect more than just your life. Mark my words, it will affect those that come after you. Let me talk to the parents in the room or anybody in the room who is considering becoming a parent one day. Listen to me very carefully. If you don't listen to anything else I say today, listen to this right here. Your kids will live in the land that you settle in. They will live in the decisions that you make. Abraham, he didn't choose to live in Haran. His father did. He was just the guy following his dad into that city. And yet the decisions of his father caused him to get stuck in a place that he did not belong. It was an inherited residency. Some of us are living in inherited lands. We are living in a land of abuse or addiction or violence or anger or perversion that came from the generation before us or the generation before them. It's just been passed down generationally, and now we find ourselves the byproduct of our broken past. That was Abraham's story. He got stuck in his daddy's land. But listen to me, if you are there today, if you are stuck in a space, whether it's inherited of your own making, let me echo what the sermon title suggests. You can't stay there. 
that is not where you're supposed to make your bed. That is not where you dig your grave. That is a season you are supposed to pass through. You can't stay there. Listen, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach this out for just a second because I, I, I can even feel sometimes in the atmosphere of a room where there's just heaviness that's keeping people stuck. The past is the past. You cannot change what happened. You cannot change what's been done or what you did. I'm not trying to minimize what you've walked through. Yes, the pain was real. Maybe there was death. Maybe there was abuse. But you are not called to live in that space. You are not called to take up residency in that space. You don't have to make mortgage payments on your daddy's debt any longer. You don't have to continue to pay for his failures. No, you are passing through this season. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't take up residency in the shadow of death. I don't stay here longer than I need to. No, I am walking through this valley and eventually I will find myself on top of a mountain that God has called me to. Do not stay there. You can't, you can't live there and lay hold of what God has for your future. You can't. Because listen, when, when you finally muster up the faith to leave, when you go, there's a promise on the other side of that going. It's the same promise that God made to Abraham. He says, if you go, I will show you. God, what am I gonna do without that person in my life? I'll show you. Where am I supposed to live? I'll show you. But I, I just, I, I don't understand how everything is gonna work. I'll show you. I'm not leaving you in this by yourself. I'm not asking you to walk out into a wilderness where you'll be isolated for years on end without me. No, I am Emmanuel. I am the God will walk with you through the valley. I am by your side and step by step, I will show you where you're headed. You just have to do the going and I will do the showing. So, so, so again, let me ask you this very important question today. Are, are you living somewhere you should be leaving? Where are you living right now? Now, as, as many of us in the room, we consider that question, I wanna make an appeal to perhaps another group of people in the room. I know that many of us find ourselves in category one, but perhaps there's another category here today. Maybe there are some who would say, hey, hey Tim, I, I hear what you're saying, and amen, that's good, pastor. But, 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 but I'm okay, like I'm living in a good place. Like I'm actually in a great season of my life right now. I left some stuff behind, I'm moving forward in God and things are actually good for me. And so I don't know how to apply this message. Well, let, let, let me offer just a little bit of advice to those who might find themselves, yea, even in a good space, in the promised land. Even when you get there, you, you still can't stay. There. Back to our, our text. Look at, again, what it says of, of Abraham. Even when Abraham reached the land that God had promised him, he still had to live there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Even after Abraham got into a good place, even there, there was something in him that said, I can't stay here. And that is displayed in the way that he lived. Faith leaves, faith lives. How did he live? Scripture tells us he lived like a foreigner in that land. That's an interesting word. In the Greek, it's the word parochios, and it means a sojourner or a resident alien. In other words, someone who understands I, I'm not native to this place. Someone who says, I might be in a good place, but this is not my final place. I'm not a native to this land. One, one theologian, Charles Smith, he writes this. A resident alien or a sojourner is evident. The way they talk, the way they dress, their mannerisms, their entertainment, their citizenship, and their friends all speak to their true native home. If someone is the same in all those areas as the natives, they're no longer sojourners. They have become permanent residents. There is a temptation to settle in every season. A temptation 
to become like the natives of this world, to adopt their customs and their practices and their goals, to just kind of morph in and evolve to become like the natives. Good season or bad season, let me warn you, there will always be a voice beckoning, pour a foundation and build your home here. Stay in this place a little bit longer. But, but Abraham warns us, hey, if you are a faithful follower of Jesus, you can never settle. You can never stay in a season. Be it good or be it bad, faith-filled people are not settlers. And the, re the way he proves this out through his life, according to Hebrews chapter 11, is that Abraham decides to live in one of these. He lives in tents. Now, if this is your home church, you know how difficult this part of the sermon is going to be for me to preach. Because you know that I loathe and despise anything and everything that has to do with camping. <laughs> Period. I don't understand how anybody in their right mind with a job would willingly, recreationally decide to spend days on end in a canvas box on the ground in the cold in the wilderness with the badgers and the bears and the foxes and the raccoons and snakes and demons and all the rest of the people that hang out in campsites. I don't get it. It is mine. Where are the campers at? You love camping. I love you. You are welcome in this place. Thank you. Robin will take you out camping with my kids. <laughs> you, get your, you get your tent, you go camp. Me and the rest of my friends, we're going to go check into the hotel on the other side. And um, we'll, make, we'll make our way to rendezvous at the beach. The beach, if you don't know where that's at, it's that big body of water that you bathe in when you're camping while the rest of us are enjoying running water and showers and other basic necessities in life. <laughs> Amen. He lived in tents. A, a, a tent makes a statement. A tent says something. When you're living in a tent, what you're saying is, I might be here right now, but this is not where I'm settling. This might be the place where I'm currently sleeping. Yeah, I, I'm hanging out here for a little bit, but, but this is not my residence. This is not my resting place. This is not where I put down roots and settle. I, I, I'm just, I'm passing through. This is a season, but I'm not staying here. A tent dweller, according to scripture, is somebody who is far more focused on the eternal than they are about the things of this world. Their gaze is set on where they're going, not where they're currently at. A tent dweller is not anxious about tomorrow because they know that tomorrow is not promised and so they're going to make the most of the opportunities in front of them today. Yeah. A, a tent dweller is not clinging to their possessions and their resources saying these are all mine because they understand that everything they have was a gift from God and what he's given to us is to be used for the purpose of building his kingdom here on the earth. A tent dweller is not obsessed with influence and accolades and titles and followers because they understand that as quickly as those things come, they can go and they are far more concerned about God's opinion than they are about the opinions of men and women. A tent dweller, they're not up in arms about their rights because they understand that they died a long time ago. Their body is not their own. They are living for Christ. They've been crucified with him and now the life that they live, they live through Christ. And a tent dweller is not looking to evolve and become more like all of the other natives around them because they know ultimately this is not my place. Ultimately I am passing through here and one day soon I'm gonna be where I truly belong. Listen, I know that we beat this drum a lot here at the Father's house and I might be a broken record with some of this stuff, but for another 30 seconds, allow me to be a broken divot record one more time. This is not it, people. This is not the goal. 
Comfort and fulfillment on planet Earth is not the high call for a Christian. This is not what we're looking for. We are passing through this life. Our gaze is to be fixed on eternity, not obsessed with the things of the world around us. We would be wise to take David's advice and to number our days because our life is but a breath of smoke. It is here one day and it is gone the next. There is only one thing that is eternal. And one day we will stand in that place with eternal foundations in a city, according to Hebrews, that God himself designed and built. And we will put our tents away once and for all. And we will settle in the courts of God forever. And that should be our obsession. That should be our aim. That should be our focus. That should wake us up in the morning. This should be the last thing we think about when we get into bed at night. One day, I'm going to stand with Jesus in eternity. Do not get caught up in the rat race of this life trying to obsess and find more for yourself. We live with an open hand with our plans and an open hand with our resources and an open hand with all that we have because this is the goal. As much as I hate it, this is the goal. To be tent dwellers here on earth. To keep our eyes fixed on eternity. La last scripture, and with this I'll invite the band to come as we conclude. These are the words of Jesus. The title in my Bible, it says, The Cost of Following Jesus. Luke 9. It says, As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. Translation, if you want to follow me, get very comfortable with one of these. We're just passing through. We're sojourners in this place. So, so I guess my invitation today is, is, is relatively simple. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. I'm saying, if you want to follow Jesus, take up your tent and let's follow him. Let's be people in a city surrounded by natives that are obsessed with accumulating more for this life. Let's be people that are countercultural, that, that have our gaze fixed on eternity and say, this ain't it. I'm living for what's coming next. Amen? Let me, let me pray for us as we conclude. If you bow your heads and close your eyes. Two groups of people I'd love to pray for today. First group, you would say, hey, Tim, I, I am, uh, I'm that one that feels like they're stuck in a season. I, uh, I know that God is calling me to leave where I'm at, to go, but, but I've been reticent to do so because I don't know what comes next. But I hear, I hear the Holy Spirit calling me again. Hey, son, daughter, it's time to go. You can't stay here today. If that's you, I want, I want to pray right now. As you take that step of faith and you move into the next chapter, whatever it might be, I want, I want to pray for you. And if that resonates, no one's looking around, but would you just lift your hands towards heaven as I pray for those that need to leave some space and move into the next? Holy Spirit, you see your sons and daughters here. You see the Abrahams, the Sarahs, the, the believers here in this space that you're saying you can't stay here. And I, and I ask for faith right now, a fresh measure of faith to go. Pray for every cord, every rope that tries to drag them back and keep them stuck. May, may they be severed right now in Jesus' name. May generational curses be broken now in Jesus' name. May liberty and freedom come to every captive so that they can leave where they're living and step into what you have for their future. Specifically, I just, this is a word for somebody, I, I pray for the conversation that needs to take place with that significant other, or the conversation that needs to take place with that friend. I pray for there to be grace in the midst of that. Let, let those words not wound, but, but let there be a real peace, a shalom from God in the midst of those difficult conversations. Bless them today as they go. In Jesus' name. Second group of people. You can put your hands down. I want to pray for those that would maybe say, hey, Tim, you're up there talking about eternity and this hope that we have that one day we're going to dwell in a city with eternal foundations. And I don't know that I have that hope. I don't know that I am confident that my eternity is spoken for. 
Maybe you've been at a distance from God for a while or maybe you've never made a decision to follow him. I wanna pray with you before we leave today. Help you make a commitment to follow Jesus afresh. And again, no one's peeking around, but as I, as I pray that prayer this morning, if that's you and you say, Tim, I need to come home to Jesus, would you lift your hand and look up at me so I know who I'm praying with? I think you got you right over there. Awesome. Yeah, I got you up there. Hallelujah, right here. Cool. I'm gonna say this and you can just repeat it under your breath. That's fine. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Thank you for giving yours for mine. Today I choose to follow you. I leave where I'm at so that I can live the life that you're calling me to live. Help me to be your disciple, to walk in your ways from this moment forward so that when I step into that space, the city that you designed and built for eternity, that you'll look me in the eye and you'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy that has been set before you. I love you. I give you all of me and I receive all of you in return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for every one of those making a decision this morning.